good evening to all of you uh, and uh, welcome to uh, Kriya Engage, uh, which is part of a webinar series that we are doing uh, at Kriya. Uh, this is really uh, a series open to uh, students, parents, educators, just generally anyone, uh, you know, for you to attend. Generally at this time, you would be out there, uh, you know, visiting schools, uh, visiting uh, colleges and talking about uh, liberal education, talking about Korea, uh, but but unfortunately, because of the current public health situation, all these are confined to our books. Uh, so we thought, what could be a better way to reach out to all of you than these webinars? And I'm sure by now, all of us have attended, you know, tons of webinars. Uh, there is an actual term called, uh, you know, over, over exposure to screen time. Uh, but we really hope that the next hour uh, and 15 minutes that you spend with us uh, are really worth your time. Uh, so today, um, you know, the, this is the third webinar that we're doing. Uh, and today we, we thought that in the context of the public, uh, you know, public health situation, uh, that is COVID-19, how do we develop uh, agility, adaptability, uh, and resilience uh, as learners, right? How can learning how to learn uh, prepare us for the challenges that lie ahead of us uh, and help us solve problems uh, that really cut across disciplines and fields uh, with empathy and understanding. Uh, so I'm grateful uh, that we have two of our uh, senior faculty members, uh, Professor Gaurav Raina and uh, Professor Akila Ramanavan, uh, who joined us today. Welcome, uh, Gaurav and Akila. Hi, look forward. Yes. Uh, so please take us through uh, the webinar. So before uh, I introduce uh, both of our speakers today, uh, I, I forgot to introduce myself, but I'm Vikram. I'm part of the communications and outreach team uh, at Kriya University. Uh, so, Dr. so Professor Akila uh, is the divisional chair uh, for literature and arts at Kriya. Uh, she is an associate professor of practice. Uh, she's also the cultural program curator uh, and has a PhD in post-colonial studies from the state of Ohio University. Uh, I jokingly say that Akhila has 28 hours uh, in her club. And if you go on her uh, Instagram page, you will see the ton of activities that she does every day. Uh, but Akhila really is, uh, is, I think, to me, a fitness enthusiast. Uh, she's a writer, she's an independent scholar, a theater actor, and also trained in Carnatic vocalist. Um, she has worked at, as learning and development manager at Pramiti Technologies. Uh, she's taught all around the world, uh, you know, in, in the University of Dayton and at the Asian College of Journalism, Chennai. Uh, she's also a key member of uh, Chennai's globally touring theatre company, Just As Repertory, and founding member of a performing arts institute, Sahadeh Foundation. Uh, and then we have, of course, Professor Gaurav Raina. Uh, Gaurav is a member of the Academic Council at Korea. Uh, he also uh, is the chair of the research council uh, and a visiting professor of mathematics and computer science uh, at Korea. Uh, he has a PhD in mathematics from uh, Cambridge University, and he's a Srinivas Ramanujan scholar. Uh, he's currently a part of also a part of uh, faculty in electronic engineering at the IIT Madras, uh, and also a visiting research fellow uh, in mathematics at the University of Cambridge. Uh, he has recently been appointed. Uh, now, this is not recently anymore. He's, he's, a, he's a chairman of uh, Mobile Payments Forum of India. Uh, many of you might know about the Bhim app. Uh, was instrumental in, in, in starting that. Uh, Gaurav also leads a venture focused on research based online math education uh, for school kids and teachers and data science for industries. Uh, so, welcome both of you. Uh, and, and please take the slide. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, so um, I think uh, I'll uh, start us off uh, by saying that uh, uh, I, I think that some of the things that Kriya stands for uh, are uh, really the need uh, of the hour. Um, uh, and uh, that Vikram introduced already uh, what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about learning how to learn. And uh, we're also going to talk about Kriya's idea of interwoven learning and what these two have to do with each other and how they can help us be better, better critical thinkers and problem solvers. Um, and uh, 
to that end, um, uh, we, we uh, some of my friends now in the sciences like to do this. Uh, they like to break things down into their component parts and then build up the whole again. So we'll do that. It's a lesson I've learned. Uh, and this is, I guess, interwoven learning in action. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, sort of look at this concept of learning how to learn. We're then going to look at the concept of interwoven learning, the Kriya way. And then we're going to talk about the role of uh, creativity uh, in, in both. So I'll ask Gaurav to start us off uh, to talk a, a little bit about learning how to learn. So we'll start with the basic ideas that go with this concept. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Akhila. So, uh, I mean, when I was looking, you know, thinking through learning how to learn, I first started thinking about how I might be learning how to learn and what do I do. Um, and I'll share a little bit of that a bit later on. But in terms of the sort of general, uh, you know, what we know from a scientific standpoint, uh, I mean, it's very clear that the mind is an extremely complex object. And so, um, I mean, of course, I'm going to give a very, very distilled version of what we actually know or some of what we actually know it really has to start with curiosity so i i think that the, the thing that one really needs to start with is to be curious about something and why does this work in a particular way why does that work a particular way? why does this happen the way it happens so it has to be started off with a sort of an element of curiosity but that's the first part the second part is where I'd like to spend a little bit of time is how can we use the, the sort of uh, curiosity to eventually solve the problem that we are curious about. Now imagine the brain, so I'm going to try and do it with the best I can. So imagine the brain uh, in multiple modes. And for the sake of simplicity, let's think of the brain in two modes, right? So you've got mode one, and you've got mode two. Now think of mode one as a football field. And imagine the football field has 20 players on it, equally spaced. And each of these players, you know, represent an idea. And you're trying to somehow focus on solving a particular problem using the ideas that are there on this football field as represented by players of the football field who are equally spaced. Now, just by focusing on the problem that you're trying to solve, you don't always make progress. And we know that. Right? So life would be so much simpler if we said, I'm just really going to focus on trying to solve this problem, and it got done. But the mind doesn't quite work that way. So on top of this first football field, think of another football field. And the other football field, for example, might have 10 players, not 20 players, 10 players. So the first one, first football field is really focused, and the second football field is very is very diffuse. So focused in its ideas and more diffuse in its ideas, and those ideas could be very could be quite different. And so one way that the brain uh, adapts itself to make progress about solving the particular problem that it has got curious about is that it starts being very focused. And then it meanders off to the other football field and starts thinking about another problem, which may not be connected to the original problem. And this shift from the time that it takes to go from the first football field to the second football field is often known as procrastination. You think of procrastination as a bad thing, but it's actually not a bad thing at all. That's the way the mind actually works. But if you do this sort of slightly cleverly, it's referred to as strategic procrastination. So you're almost training the brain to move away from the problem that you're trying to solve. And as you move away from the problem, the brain starts thinking of slightly other problems or slight other aspects. And hence, when it comes back to the first football field, which is the problem that you're trying to solve, you might come up with a new idea. And so going through this process up and down, up and down, up and down, and it takes time. It's not going to happen in a day. It's not going to happen in a week. Right? It, it takes a while to do this. But this is essentially uh, you know, one of the key elements of how the brain learns to learn. But of course, there are other elements of it as well, uh, which are 
partly recognized, but sometimes I feel they're not as well appreciated uh, as they ought to be. And that is the, the importance of sleep and cycle in learning and memory formation. I mean, you often hear people saying, right, that, oh, you know, I'll sleep over this problem. Well, there's a very scientific reason why they might say that, right? because when you sleep over it, you're kind of actually detoxifying your brain and you get up the next morning. Now, the same thing happens when you're looking for new experiences. And that's why people say, oh my God, you know, I went for this holiday or I traveled somewhere and it was a great experience and I learned so much. But another way of enhancing the brain's capability of learning and memory formation actually turns out to be exercise. So just plain simple walking, you know, maybe for half an hour or 45 minutes a day can really enhance your ability to learn and also to form memory. So that's my sort of <clears throat> slightly simplistic representation of learning to learn. Start off by, uh, by <clears throat> start off by being curious. Um, then you sort of go between being focused, strategic procrastination and more diffuse way um, of, of, of thoughts and go up and down between them as the brain learns how to learn. And if you just add and sleep, uh, you add some sleep and exercise to it, I think you've got a, uh, you know, I think you've got yourself going for learning to learn. So Akhila, that's, that's my small, uh, simple sort of representation of learning to learn. Uh, aspect of this, I hope I've unmuted. Have I? Okay, I have. Um, so what he's, uh, what he's uh, just always had to have to check because it's happened so many times uh, since the COVID outbreak that I'm speaking and, you know, the, the things are mute. But anyway, so he started out talking about the complexity of the brain, the complexity of the mind, and what really happens when you procrastinate and how that uh, procrastination can be productive. Um, he also talked about these two modes, right? Uh, I think we can lay, uh, at, uh, we can add another layer of complexity to this conversation on learning how to learn. Uh, and I, I think we can think about how the brain is always doing two things. Um, these, the two things it's doing, uh, and without going into the particularities of neuroscience or any other complex field, right? Because, you know, we're just trying to understand this on a human level. We're young, we're 17, we're students, we're trying to get into college, you know, we're trying to cram as much information in our heads as possible, right? So at this time, what do we need to be thinking about? Uh, the brain is doing two things when we're learning. One is it's trying to absorb all this so-called content, the stuff that it's supposed to absorb. Another part of it is constantly trying to get a grip on this content in a broader way. In chemistry, we do this. In maths, we do this. In English, we do this. Oh, sometimes, you know, oh, we write an introduction here. We also write an introduction there. So when you start seeing those parallels, then you're really onto something. Then if you start being conscious of those parallels and the ways in which the way you learn in one field may have a bearing on the way you learn in another field. When you start noticing commonalities, when you also start noticing divergences, different ways in which different fields construct knowledge, right? That's what you're doing when, when you're working on uh, every theory, every equation, every new concept, uh, every new artwork, it's constructing knowledge in a field, if you want to think about it like that, if you want to think of the field as a building, right? So it's something that's, that's being built up. Now, once you start noticing these convergences and divergences, then you're on to something. Once you start honing that other level ability, going beyond the content to really think about, okay, what am I doing here that might be similar to how a biologist approaches this, uh, how a physicist approaches this, uh, how an artist approaches this, um, then you're starting to get somewhere. And this is the most crucial learning you can have. I'll explain it through one more metaphor. Uh, it's not really a metaphor, it's based on my own experience as an actor. So if you're a theater actor, uh, you are supposed to learn a role. 
right? So if you're playing Juliet and Romeo and Juliet, you have to be love lorn, you have to be dreaming about Romeo and all that stuff is happening. Okay, it's show night. What happens before show night? You're at the tech rehearsal, right? Some uh, lighting designer uh, and, his, and his team are going around marking the stage with, this, with glow tape so that you can see in the dark when the lights are out and you come and take your position. And then the lights come on. What needs to happen? You, as Juliet, have to feel completely moonstruck and in love with Romeo and worried and wanting to see him, not wanting to see him, all that stuff is happening. On another level, what's happening is you have to go from this uh, spotlight to that side light. You have to walk the path. You have to climb up the platform to look at uh, Romeo and to sigh lovingly. So this other part of your brain has to be hyperactive. It has to tell you where to go and what to do. Otherwise, bad things happen. You have to really practice this, right? And every stage is different. Every lighting plot is different. Every audience is different. So you're dealing with a whole bunch of variables. And the other stuff that you actually know is your lines and the ability to be in character. So you do need your content. You need to know your lines. You need to know how to lose yourself. But you also need to be aware of something else that's happening. And that's where learning how to learn connects with what we talk about in Kriya as interwoven, interwoven learning. Now, um, our idea of interwoven learning is very similar to uh, what I was talking about here in terms of image. We are talking again about things coming together and going apart and watching how they come together and go apart. So we have this idea of interweaving. And uh, uh, this, is the, this is the definition that the faculty of Kriya have come up with together. Um, so interweaving signals a braided imagination, much in the sense that hair is braided or uh, fabric is braided. So what we're doing um, when we are constructing that knowledge is to create a fabric of togetherness in which varied knowledge systems cohere con to constitute the warp and the weft of human endeavor and innovation. Now that sounds very fancy, but think about all the knowledge in the world as this fabric, right? And it's got a warp and it's got a weft. And, and what's happening is these things all come together uh, in, uh, and produce new knowledge. So the weaving is never quite complete. And you can also see places where uh, there are divergences. The fabric is not, it, it, it's, uh, it's not perfectly woven in a power loom. It's a hand loom. Right? So you can see the imperfections, you can see the beauty of that fabric. And in fact, in some of that imperfection is the beauty. So, and what, why we say interwoven and not interdisciplinary, that word everybody knows, it's, it's about working across disciplines. So if Gaurav works in math and computer science, I work in literature and the arts, we come together, we work on an article together that incorporates perspectives from these four fields. That's sort of interdisciplinary, right? We write an article, we try to combine these perspectives. But what we're trying to do is something much bigger. It's, uh, it's the, we're working with the messiness of this fabric, how different knowledge systems have come together, they've gone apart. Uh, it, it's kind of like the messy and chaotic world we live in. And, you know, if, if, you, if, if the world was messy and chaotic before, now think about the world. Uh, for instance, the question of health is a very pressing one right now. The question of the economy is another very pressing one right now. Sometimes it feels like those two things are in tension. They, uh, there's a way in which, if you, you know, not taking care of your health may speed up the economy, or if you start opening up the economy, then that interferes with your health. So, you know, th there are ways in which there, there are tensions between uh, these, these uh, two areas, right? So what interwoven learning allows us to do is to look at those tensions, to understand those tensions, and out of that, bring about some, uh, uh, come up with a problem that uh, which, which when we solve really makes a difference. So what we want students to do is to understand uh, and respect uh, this kind of very dynamic interwovenness. It's not static, it's always changing. Disciplines are changing, the world is changing, we are changing. 
technology is changing. So we have to explore multiple ways of thinking and we have to come up with holistic solutions. They are, they are field agnostic, they are area agnostic, right? So arts, science, sciences, humanities, all have to come together and to diverge so that we can take, take knowledge forward and we can solve some of the most pressing problems we have right now. Uh, I have one more little bit. This is something that is on the CREA website. You can go read up about this. So in order to uh, explore interwoven learning at CREA, we have these very important guiding principles. Uh, if Ranjit has it and he can put it up and share the, the guiding principles infographic, that would be great. If not, it's not a problem. So every class in CREA, whether it's a core and skills class, or if uh, it, is a, it is our majors or minors, they have, they have this sort of uh, mandate to uh, follow these guiding principles to some extent, um, to the extent necessary or the next extent desirable in, in each, each of our fields. So every major has to be writing intensive, uh, interdisciplinary, research-based. It it, in, in, in every major, there will be a sense of uh, the historicity of different ideas, concepts, and practices. So when we study a particular movement or a theory or a concept, uh, we, we will place it in history. We'll think about where, where it is in, in space and time. And we'll think about the implications of that history. Uh, we also think about the ethics uh, of every discipline. Uh, we also uh, want to provide immersive experiences, not just internships, but ways in which we can have a fluid kind of exchange between practitioners and scholars. Um, and students can partake of this kind of exchange. Uh, we need to focus on technology and data analytics. Um, and we also have to become very comfortable and this matters more than ever now. Uh, become we have to both raise and be comfortable with unanswered and unanswerable questions. So um, this is how we are thinking about interwoven learning, and I'm sure you guys are going, "Wow, that's super ambitious." But then I think you also realize that the the the, the vital importance of such an approach at a time when we're living with so many unanswered and unanswerable questions starting from will we all be able to go back to our campuses or our schools in the fall right uh, starting from a question like that so what does it take what does it take to explore interpersonal learning to, to walk together on this path it takes creativity this is something that gaurav mentioned at the very beginning and Gaurav, I invite you to talk about creativity, and its importance in learning how to learn and interwoven learning. Uh, I'll start a little bit by talking about sort of my life in terms of what I do um, and, and how that sort of relates to me sort of personally. So I have, I, I almost lead a sort of dual life. Right? So I'm, a, I'm an academic. Um, I work in mathematics and computer science. Uh, and I'm also an entrepreneur, so I have a company in data science and artificial intelligence. Um, now, both these worlds are really, really different to each other. Um, and I think working at the intersection of things which are very different uh, is, uh, is, is, is one of the ingredients for spurring sort of creativity. Um, and, and that would lead on to sort of interwoven learning. So at a broad level, when I'm thinking in academia, I'm usually thinking of problems which I would like to think about on a three-year time scale or a five-year time scale, or sometimes on a 10-year time scale. When I'm working in, with industry, uh, usually the time scales are roughly two to three months. Right? So there's a dramatic shift, mental shift on the time scales that I have to think even on the same day. In the morning, I might spend half an hour thinking about something that has to be addressed within two weeks or a month. And in the afternoon, I'll be thinking about a problem which needs to be addressed over 10 years. So just time scales gets you, gets different perspectives coming in. On the other hand, when I'm sitting in academia and if I'm, let's say, working in mathematics, I'm often driven by problems that I might find fascinating or beautiful 
or I'm, I'm chasing solutions which might have a certain sort of mathematical elegance to them, irrespective of the potential application that they may or may not eventually have. But when you shift to being an entrepreneur, you don't always have that luxury. You have to solve the problem that the customer wants to solve. Right? You can't say, hey, this is a problem that I can solve. Uh, they're like very good for you, but please solve my problem. So just the fact that you've got these two different time scales and two different perspectives, even when you're working within the domain of, let's say, mathematics and computer science at one end and artificial intelligence and data science at the other end, really forces you to think uh, in potentially interesting ways. Uh, and, and there's the opportunity of taking the more entrepreneurial mindset into academic settings and also taking more uh, academic type mindsets into entrepreneurial settings, right? So you should be in a position to, for example, go to a customer and say, look, this is a problem that you wanted me to solve, but here's another problem that I could solve. Maybe you'll have a use of it. And so I think one way of thinking about creativity and interwovenness is to try to train one's brain uh, and train oneself thinking along almost along along dimensions or along concepts which initially may look very very different from each other but at a meta level um, you know they, they're bound to be as long as whatever you are doing is can be can be deemed or seen as approximately creative right? there's bound to be cross connections right it, it just means that you maybe you haven't spotted it yet but if you just, you know, if you have the patience and, you know, I, I think anybody, anybody can testify that, you know, the whole process of creativity does not happen overnight. You have to make small steps. You have to do what you can do. Uh, you have to be flexible about not just going for a particular solution or a particular viewpoint. And as long as you're open to that and you're willing to live with knowing that you don't know everything, uh, at any one point of time and the only way that you're really progressing is that so one way the way i think about it i always think that i'm always confused except that i'm hopefully more confused about more sophisticated issues than i was maybe three months or two years ago so that's my <laughs> perspective on <laughs> that's my perspective on creativity uh the process of creativity how i try and do it within uh, you know, what i do and, and how I look at it. I always feel confused. I, I just hope that I'm less confused uh, than I was earlier or confused about more sophisticated things. So, so what does it, I mean, this is my perspective, I can have from, let's say, uh, you know, math, computer science, academically, or from another entrepreneurial standpoint. Uh, I mean, at another level, uh, I mean, you're diametrically opposite to, to me. You do arts and literature, or it seems as if you're diametrically opposite at some level. You do arts and literature and theater. Um, uh, what does creativity mean to you and in your lives, in the various lives that you lead within and outside academia? Uh, how do you see creativity fostering in your life? Well, um, for me, I mean, on, on the one level, I, I would say that uh, I associate creativity with a certain elegance of framing concepts. Uh, better and better with language, with words, because that's my trade, right? And so I'll say I agree with you on this, uh, on being confused, but I'd like to say that I I'm enriched by my confusions. I think you are too. Uh, and anyway, uh, I think for me, uh, creativity really means curiosity. It is the opposite of boredom. And what I know for myself, uh, definitely uh, growing up uh, as a teenager or in my 20s or what, whatever it is, uh, a lot of the times I would say I'm bored, I'm bored. And, and then, you know, not really do anything about it. And I think that's the rut you need to get out of. You have to not be bored. And how can you not be bored? I think not being bored involves 
being in the moment and really enjoying everything around you. Even the little ant, especially now that we're all stuck at home, right? Like it is even watching, I have a friend who's an artist and an illustrator and you know, she'll spend the longest time staring at dragonflies and insects and uh, it looks like she's doing nothing. Right. And it looks like such a small thing, like a little ant uh, going across the windowsill or some dragonfly perched somewhere. And she's looking at it. But then later, a beautiful illustration comes out of it. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So I think that ability to be in the moment and to enjoy it, right, the zest for life um, that, that you see, you see it in truly creative people, you see it in leaders. You know, you have to have that curiosity too, that goes with, which is the opposite of boredom, and that zest for life, that, that feeling of really being alive all the time. Just, you know, knowing that all around you, something is happening even in stillness, right? Uh, atoms are moving, molecules are moving. I mean, there's a whole world out there if you only care to look. I think that's where creativity starts. And the second thing is, I think constraints are key to creativity. I think you need to sometimes have the discipline and the boredom to do something over and over again and tough it out. And then within, the, because of those constraints, not within them, because of those constraints, something fantastic will happen. Uh, and sometimes if you don't have a budget, and you're working on something, right? You will create a way to work around that lack of budget. It's that sim it, on a very simple level. It doesn't have to be some grand creativity. You have a project, you have to finish it. You don't have enough money for it. Something beautiful and new, you will find a way. Human beings are very, very uh, original in this way. They can find ways around everything. And the last quality I associate with creativity, I, I don't know. These are things that I've learned. I'm sure there are other facets to creativity that if I think about, they'll keep coming. But the, the last quality I can think of right at the moment is empathy. And I don't mean empathy in the sense of, uh, you know, really commiserating in people's suffering. So that's, that's also important. And, you know, compassion is another quality we talk about. But really the ability to think about everybody from the student to the teacher, to the person uh, who works, uh, the construction worker, uh, to the person who's the household worker, uh, anybody, anybody that you see, the leader, your CEO, uh, your end user, if you're working in a company, uh, your client, you know, again, if you're working in a company and they have end users. So if, if you look at all these uh, populations, you should be able to think how they think, feel how they feel. The think how they think we get most of the time, feel how they feel, that emotional intelligence is really what is vital for uh, creativity. So that's my, I, I don't know, Gaurav, do you feel like we're poles apart in this? So would you like to add something or do you find what I say also translatable into what you do. I think you're on mute. Absolutely. <laughs> That's the only thing I'd say to you. Thank you so much for pointing it out. Uh, but no, I, I think when you take a sort of slightly broad perspective of, um, you know, not just a sort of appreciating the other, right, or understanding the other, but trying to learn lessons from how others think is another critical ingredient of creativity i think right so if you say that you know what do we really need in the world today or one of some of the things that we need in the world today of course we need creativity we need the idea to be able to generate new ideas uh, and especially in the sort of covid world right i mean you know it that's really has come to the fore in terms of new, new general ideas then you think about critical thinking um then you also think about collaboration right I mean, I don't think we'll be able either regionally, nationally, or internationally be able to truly get through uh, COVID without any serious element of, of collaboration. But just picking on this previous point that you mentioned about thinking about the other, right? I'd like to sort of draw another sort of perspective to it is not just thinking about the other, but thinking about how the other person thinks and trying to get that thought process in what you do. And that as a way of enhancing <coughs> creativity. Uh, in, in Korea, we can sort of refer, we do refer it to as interweaving, so to speak. And I'll give a very specific example. 
You can say that what is common between applied mathematics and making movies? And at first shot, you'd say, well, not much, maybe. Right? I mean, there are lots of movies about mathematicians. That I'm not talking about that, right? Uh, and usually they're not very happy movies, so I would not really recommend them. They're usually about people who've done absolutely brilliant and at some point of time have kind of gone off the rails and, you know, uh, they're not really portrayed as the most, you know, likable people in the world. Uh, so that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, here's a very brief snapshot of how, how applied mathematicians might think, or at least how I think. You're trying to model something in the real world. And the real world is really, really complex. So you can't capture everything in the real world. So what you do is you develop abstractions of the real world. And these abstractions are simplifications of the real world when you look at the real world through a particular lens. And then what you do is, so you can have multiple abstractions of the real world. And then what you do is you develop a mathematical model for the abstraction. In fact, you could have multiple models for the same abstraction. And then once you've got a mathematical model, then you apply mathematics, i.e. you apply tools. You might want to solve the model in some way or another using some tools that you're familiar with. But there's a completely creative part, which is how do I go from the real world to an abstraction? And then how do I go from the abstraction to the model? And my personal experience of, of sort of, let's say, my first initial uh, real interwoven experience at Korea was when we had uh, Professor Hari Haran, uh, who deconstructed a 10 minute movie over two hours. This is a movie called The Lunch Date. It was a 10 minute movie, but he deconstructed it over two hours. And how, uh, uh, you know, how somebody who's making a movie thinks of reality how they're abstracting reality, how they're representing reality, how very technical things like aspect ratios and angles and light high highlight the different aspects of reality. And frankly, I come, came away after the two hour session saying that all applied, budding applied mathematicians should definitely do a course or two in movie making. I think, you know, there's a great lessons to be learned. I think there's a great cross fertilization to happen. And I think as long as you are willing to be open to experience new ideas, to look at other, how other people think, right? not just how they feel, but how they think, how they create, and find that as a way of, uh, find that as a means of sort of incorporating even some of that into your art, into your craft. Okay? Uh, I think eventually one would lead to uh, hopefully be more creative. And what I've just described here, which is a, you know, a, a very tangible experience that I had very early on in Korea, highlights creativity, highlights critical thinking, highlights collaboration, right? I mean, this would not happen. I've, subsequently, I've had numerous wonderful conversations with Professor Hari Haran, um, you know, and I'm just curious to learn more and more about how he thinks. Right? And perhaps from a slightly self-interested way, because I want to try and see whether I can incorporate some of those learnings into becoming a better, slightly better applied mathematician myself and perhaps teach my students uh, you know, the whole creative process right at the, at the beginning. So that's my experience at the intersection of creativity, critical thinking, and collaboration. Uh, Akhila, do you have one? I mean, do you have something that you can uh, talk about? I just I want to react to what you said and I think that uh, what you're also implying is something that's very important uh, people do lip service to this idea uh, and there's a lot you know there's a lot of uh, you know mumbo jumbo a lot of writing on this but, but most people don't really walk this talk I think we need to let go of the self in learning to think like somebody else and what that means is let go of your idea that your field or your subject or your area or that thing that you're so sure of is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Let go of that. Be willing to be enriched by somebody else's way of thinking, the, the grounding they have, their specialization, their way of seeing the world. You know, I think you need wonder and you need humility. These two qualities are very essential. 
uh, without making a big deal out of this stuff. You just need to say, okay, let me not think in my life that literature is the only subject that needs to be taught. Uh, literature is the only subject that needs to be learned. Um, uh, let me understand uh, that you know, there are other fields that provide equally valuable perspectives. And first of all, not trade them off against each other, but think about how it all comes together to reflect uh, our capacity for imagination, our capacity to do new things, to be inspired by each other. What you need is inspiration, right? I mean, in the end, and inspiration can come from the strangest of places. Right? If you watch the imitation game, uh, Turing is at a bar uh, uh, and he listens to a conversation and he cracks something in that moment. It doesn't come when he's sitting at his desk working on a particular problem. It comes somewhere else because of a human interaction between two people. So in that sense, our sense that we are the greatest thing because we are these specialists or experts also has to go. We have to be able to think how not only a movie maker think, thinks, but how the local auto guy thinks, right? And the local uh, garland weaver thinks. Uh, those things are important too, is what I feel. But I think perhaps literature allows you to see that because, because you know, a lot of art and a lot of literature is about people. I think you need, need to like, you need to embrace uh, your interest in people. You don't have to be an extrovert, but you should be interested in people. That we forget. Uh, well, thank you, Professor Akira and uh, Professor Gaurav for actually enriching our confusion. <laughs> but now uh, we have uh, a couple of questions. So we've received some questions uh, while registrations. Uh, so I'd like uh, one by one uh, each of them to ask the questions. So first, can we have uh, Ms. Shubhra Sharma? Uh, Ma'am, can you uh, meet yourself and uh, go ahead and ask the question? Give me an opportunity. And uh, uh, my question is for Professor Akhila. And uh, uh, I'm just uh, telling you, letting you know that uh, I've been teaching almost past 20 years now. And uh, uh, I realized that the most difficult thing about being a learner is to really be open to learning. And uh, as in your uh, talk, you did emphasize that uh, the real learning happens when you start making uh, cross connections within the content that we are uh, dealing with. Uh, and to me, it seems a very natural way to attempt to connect new observations to past learnings and experiences for understanding better when attempt to make cross connections. And uh, however, the same past experiences and learnings sometimes lead to a mind block to some extent, which uh, in turn hinders learning. So uh, uh, my question is, uh, one, do the past learnings and experiences set a limit to how much one can learn? And second, what is the best way to let go of the mind blocks arising from these past experiences? Wow, I didn't think Q&A would start with this really difficult question. So I'm going to attempt an answer, then I'm going to hand it over to Gaurav because I think he'll have some, he, this, is a, this is a hard one. Thank you for this question. Uh, past learnings and experiences, yes, I've had this experience, for instance, with classical music because I, had, I have a mind block. Uh, and so many things, including math. Um, and uh, yes, I think there are ways in which you can be imprisoned by your past experiences. How do you get free of them? I think, I think uh, one thing is to be aware of them, but to be gentle with yourself, not beat yourself up because you're bad at something, you're not able to, you know, those, you have to let go of that. And then, there's this other thing. Uh, anecdotally, I can tell you that uh, uh, I was a TA uh, in the US. I was there on fellowship and I had to, I had this TA ship and I was making the princely sum of $800 a month. And to keep that $800 a month, I had to have a certain GPA. <laughs> and uh, my parents could have, couldn't have afforded to send me the scholarship money. We were middle class at the time. And uh, so I had a class that was quantitative. 
and I ended up getting an A in that class because I was so afraid that I my GPA would drop so I wouldn't get that eight hundred dollars. So sometimes, sometimes it just takes constraints. This is what I meant about constraints to free your mind. This 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 fear of math was replaced by an even bigger fear. So you know this went away completely and I just applied myself and I got there. So sometimes, yeah, it can be as simple as that, but I think it's a lifelong thing. God, have you have anything to add? Uh, Notwithstanding fear, which is always a good thing, uh, I think what I have found in the past, see, it's, I mean, you know, not to, you know, it, it requires a very high degree of awareness, self-awareness, you know, not to either beat yourself up about something or to actually get out of a particular situation you are in. Uh, what I have found to be a fairly good way to, you know, come out of that, uh, notwithstanding a constrained situation, is to interact with unlike minds. When you interact with unlike minds, there's a sort of natural or fairly natural sort of curiosity and a sort of dopamine effect that happens in the mind. Like, oh, wow, the person thinks this way? I never thought of this. Oh, wow, you know? Oh, the person does this and think this is interesting? I never thought of this. A person does this for a living? Oh, wow, that's great. You know, so I think just meeting unlike minds is, is a way to constantly keep yourself invigorated, excited about learning, uh, and, and is also a way to sometimes get yourself out of a particular situation that you might find yourself bottled in. So my simple sort of solution, or one, one solution is just find unlike minds and talk to them. And it's, it's you know, a mind is a complex object, it's a wonderful object, um, and, and nothing like unlike minds. Because you, otherwise, you know, the reason we get stuck is because we keep talking to people who reconfirm what we believe in, right? Yeah. Or what we think or how we think. So just going out and talking to an unlike mind, I think is, uh, uh, is is something that I found quite useful. Uh, that that's my two bits. Thank you. Uh, can we now have Archit? Archit, can you go ahead? Archit, please introduce yourself. We can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so I am Archita Sawa. Indore, Madhya Pradesh. My question was, um, what do you think challenges or rather changes for the 21st century post the COVID-19? For example, people just passing out of uh, for them there will be less jobs out there. Entrepreneurs will find um, existing professionals will surely face some hindrances in their work. So uh, I also wanted to ask, how can such people for such drastic changes that are about to come in the future? Have already... So Vikram, is it possible maybe to type the question? I heard less jobs, creative problems post COVID, but I don't want to construct a question when there was a so maybe can you, maybe you can just type out the question. I think the first question was what was the what are the biggest challenges you see, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, Chips, yeah. Post COVID nineteen, post pandemic. Uh, what do you think is the new challenges or uh, changes? Twenty first century learners yes. will face post the. So one is what are going to be twenty first century challenges post COVID? Is that the first question? Okay, I mean, I can have a very quick shot at it. I can't think of anything that will not be a challenge. Pick any <laughs> industry. I mean, frankly, frankly, 
pick any industry you can think of, think any basic aspect of life you can think of, frankly, we'll have to reimagine it. Education, supply chains, capitalism, institution. Rev is off. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can keep going. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, what Gaurav is saying is, I mean, this is a very pertinent question. And I think uh, what we're finding in our conversations with each other, this is what we're asking each other, right? The faculty. Uh, and we're also asking how then, if there are going to be challenges across the board on how people learn, how people teach, how people ready themselves for the workforce, what that workforce is going to look like, what families are going to look like. I mean, everything, everything in the public and the private sphere is going to change, at least in the short term, where we might come back to things differently in the long term. And also there are ways in which we need to be thinking in the long term about how COVID-19 relates to the climate crisis and so on and so forth. So I think a uh, different kind of vigilance uh, on, the, on the parts of all kinds of stakeholders is what, what we're going to need. Uh, but um, I think uh, to me, on a human level, uh, while we wait for Gaurav to come back, he, he'll talk more about this on, on the level of, uh, say, the economy or you know, where we're headed in terms of systemically where we're headed. Uh, you know, what's going to happen in the future. But honestly, I think how are we going to hold on to our happiness? How are we going to hold on to our notions of who we are? And how are we going to work together to solve problems? I mean, uh, we have to have different paradigms, different ways of working. You know, the old competitive models, are we going to be isolationist? Uh, are we going to be protectionist? You know, uh, or are we going to hold hands globally? You see so many different discourses emerging at this time, right? And you also see sort of uh, all of, you know, politics intersecting with this major pandemic and health issues in a very particular way. So what, are, where is leadership going? I think the biggest challenge, honestly, is leadership. Are we going to have constructive leadership that takes humanity forward and you know, keeps the planet safe? Or are we going to have the kind of leadership that ultimately creates more challenges for us? This is the big question. And I think depending on how you feel ideologically, you, you know, you'll define uh, what that leadership should look like differently. But I, read, I think the need of the hour is for us to find common ground. And whether we're going to be able to do that, whether we're able to find common ground across the political spectrum, ideological spectrum, uh, across our fields, that, that I think is the biggest challenge. How do we arrive there? How do we create those conversations? I think that's really key. That's really key. Thank you, Akila. Thank you, Archit. Uh, while we wait for Gaurav to come back, we can probably take the next question. Uh, Bhavisha, can you go ahead? Uh, hi. 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 Uh, I'm Vrisha. I'm a high schooler from New Delhi. And um, uh, my first question is uh, to you, Dr. Um, uh, as far as I know, you're a PhD, you have a PhD in literature. And um, as someone who's interested in that field, uh, a lot of people around me have told me about how currently in the current uh, pandemic situation and a few years into the future, humanities is not really going to be at the forefront, globally at the forefront, and how STEM, how STEM uh, industries would be more prevalent. So what job prospects would uh, be present for someone interested in literature and um, what, what job prospects would be available? What should be our future plans for college? postgraduate, what, what should we plan ahead for ourselves? <laughs> who are those people, Bhavisha, who told you this stuff? Let me, <laughs> I, I'd like to meet them. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. That's just a joke. Uh, I do understand. Um, how do you plan, honestly, 
when uh, the plans have not really helped us so far? That's, that's a larger question, right? Whatever planning we've done in, 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 at, a, at a global level, at a national level, none of that has really worked. We were taken by surprise, right? So the reason I'm saying this is planning is very important. Planning your career is important. Uh, figuring out what you want to do is very, very important. But working back from where are the jobs is usually not the best way to get a job. This is something that we need to really think about. And I really believe this. I think research shows this. Um, I, I think that, yes, some people, it might work for some people that, that they do that. But I think that if you get really good at what you do, that's what gets you the job. And it can get you a job. Many degrees in the humanities and the arts. There's a book um, called The Whole Brain, I think, by this, uh, this guy named Daniel Pink. Uh, it's a really mind. brilliant Huh? The whole new mind. The whole new mind. Yeah, that, that's what it's called. And what uh, Daniel Pink says in that book is uh, that right brainers will really rule the earth at some point, right? It's left the, and, and if you read the book, it, it's very compelling, actually. What, what we learn through humanities and the arts, and you can learn these things through the sciences as well. You know, it's just, you know, you have to have an education system that allows holistic learning. But uh, what you can learn through the humanities and the arts is to be creative, is to be curious, is to be agile. To, uh, so, it, for instance, what does a journalist who's covering COVID now have to do? Has to go out and quickly research and read up on, on health, right? And then be able to responsibly, ethically report. It's a huge responsibility, right? Because you're, you're reaching a mass audience. You have to be able to tell that mass audience what is going on uh, with the scientists, with the doctors, what these numbers mean, right? what these graphs mean. right? And a, a degree in literature should also enable students to do that kind of work. So it really, it, to me, um, it's as versatile as anything else. The other thing that we can think about is that um, working in the humanities and the arts uh, also develops your empathy. And that's again the, uh, uh, the need of the hour. So I think combining the humanities and the arts with not being a, sort of being discipline agnostic in your approach to learning. So if you get into literature or the humanities, you should be open to the sciences and the social sciences. You should pick up electives in those areas. You should cultivate curiosity in more than your discipline. So that's my answer, because that's what's going to save you in the end. Because I walked into a tech company, I had to quickly understand how programmers think, software programmers think, how they, what their communication needs are and run communication sessions for them. For that, I couldn't say, I'm not gonna understand the world of software programming. I had to go in there and figure that stuff out. So ideally, your degree, your undergraduate degree should prepare you for that kind of, so should create that kind of openness and curiosity in you. That's what we aim to do here at CREA. So, I mean, I have, you know, we have conversations across the table all the time as faculty. So students will be having those same conversations. Our courses have conversations with each other. And so in the end, though this, though, though, when we're so attached to the thought of majoring in something, it really shouldn't matter what you majored in because you might end up doing something completely different with your life. What matters is that you've cultivated all these qualities Gaurav and I talked about in the beginning. And he holds them dear as an applied mathematician and entrepreneur and computer scientist, and so do I. So what's the difference? What's the difference? True. Just be good at what you do. Work hard. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Babisha. Yeah. We have a lot of questions yeah. coming for you. Good question. Another <laughs> 15 minutes. So, uh, next we have Vishal. Vishal, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi, Vishal. Hi, ma'am. Hi, ma'am. This is Vishal. Uh, um, so, can you speak up a little bit? A, a very uh, important. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Is it fine now? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, tell me. Yeah. yeah. So, um, there has been this 
question uh, which has been haunting me for like whenever i have been matured from like um, how does one take up learning as a self motivated factor other than being seeing it as a workload like um uh, in in my early days i have been uh, seeing it uh, like learning as something to do uh, when my mother says uh, tell me tells me to uh do i need to study like that so when does one take it up as something as a, a self motivated factor like i need to study other than self interest how does one create interest in learning that's my question thanks vishal you're talking about something that you can still be afflicted with even when you're at min my position sometimes i just don't want to do the work <laughs> i don't want to focus I, i don't want to concentrate so i completely empathize with how you feel i feel like that much of the time let me tell you but i, I think okay so people talk about intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation and how you know sometimes okay so in the workplace it translates to what you are driven by what your interests are but on the outside you know the perks that you get right so the treats i mean when we were a kid it's like you know okay i'll make you a really nice sandwich your favorite kind of sandwich or something i'll take you out for ice cream right you finish this and in my experience we need both right and so cultivating intrinsic motivation i think has to do with uh i used to run let me put it so you have to say i set a target and you have to try and hit that target and you have to be stubborn about it you have to tell your brain no 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 when it wants to switch off and then when you when you get to that 1 and 1/2 kilometers or whatever target you set for yourself you should run just a little more just 10 even 10 paces more than your target but you have to meet your target a marathon uh, told me this once he said uh, you can slow down but you can never stop okay so setting goals like that when it's painful especially to learn and it, when when you rather be doing anything else in the world and then and then you say okay if i can if i can get there i will treat myself to x and then you'll really enjoy that treat right so it's a mixture i think you have to trick i think honestly nobody is happy to work all the time okay but i think you have to sort of uh, find that balance and you have to set standards for yourself it can't be coming from your mom or your dad or anybody else or your teacher it's just something where you become your own mom your own dad and your own teacher and you you know you give, you whack yourself on the head when you don't meet your targets and then something beautiful will happen along the way most of the time you start getting interested in what you do the we are bored and we don't want to learn when we don't have expertise right so once you start cultivating when you can when you play guitar and such a pain and your fingers hurt and all this stuff right when you're going through those terrible guitar classes when you're a kid or violin classes or whatever right one day you're able to play that song or one day you're able to read that sentence remember when you could first read a sentence in a book and that feeling of accomplishment right you have to hold out for that you, you shouldn't expect it but you should keep you know you you have to really be strict with yourself that's the only way to get past that and then the the intrinsic motivation will come i promise you it will with something somewhere thank you thank you sushant you are thank you so now we have a final live question should be enough can you unmute yourself can you hear me Veena Jasmine, are you with us? <laughs> okay, so we'll go to the chat questions now. Or should I just read out her question? I have it with me. Very interesting one. Okay, welcome back, Gaurav. She says, uh, "Learning makes us to understand new things, which will create a sense of joy in our mind." but in my class students are not able to enjoy learning even though they they are interested i think in india most of the education institutions are preferring bookish learning because of this students are not able to think and express their own ideas they are just considering learning as a method to score good marks but beyond that we can learn from everything around us for example while taking teachers while teachers taking their lessons we can also learn from them at how they speak how they expressing their ideas and connecting their concepts 
that most of the students failed in realizing this kind of a thing. Why is it so? Gaurav, you know all the heavy lifting so in your turn. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I went out at the time, so just to revert at the time that I left, uh, I, I think uh, the question was, what are the problems that you need to solve? And, and that is a fantastic internet connectivity for everybody around the globe. And I think so that would be one thing to solve. Sibiraj, <laughs> come online. We can see you now. Sibiraj, do you want to? Yeah. Go ahead, so go ahead. The, the... So the, the issue about, um, you know, uh, the, the, the general state of learning in high schools, you know, in schools, uh, I completely, I, I kind of agree with you, right? Um, what we are trying, so I, I don't have an answer to that in terms of why that is the case. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a simple answer to that. Uh, what we're trying to do is at least at the university level, right, when you're entering, uh, you know, at the university level. So at least at that level, at the higher ed level, uh, Korea University is is really trying to reimagine uh, what learning should be like, uh, what it ought to be like. Um, and that's where the, the sort of interwoven mandate, uh, which Akhila has talked about, comes in. That's where the guiding principles that we've talked about comes in. That's where the concept of learning to learn comes in. That's where creativity, critical thinking, and collaboration all sort of comes in. So unfortunately, I don't have a question in terms of why that is not there at the high school level. Um, 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 but at the university level, that, that's where Korea University is uh, aiming to at least uh, have, have a dent in that space. Akhila, do you want to add something? No, you can take the next three. <laughs> no, my, my other thing is sometimes though, uh, we have most, the real world uh, is not going to live up to our expectations. So I'll, all, I'll just pass on this lesson from my mom. It's just tough love. It's like, there's a library, isn't there? I complained about the attitude of the other students in my class in college. And uh, she said, you know, it doesn't matter what they're doing. What are you doing? Right? There's a library. You know, even if you don't like your teacher, you don't like the other students, get out there and read. Read on the topics that are being covered in the course. And you, you have to be dynamic learners. Uh, sometimes teachers will respond to that one dynamic learner in the room. So, and it can start influencing other people's behaviors too. You don't do it for that reason, but it's, it's good to be a leader in this regard. And, you know, read, go learn, go discover on your own. Don't wait for somebody else to come along. We'll take this question from Harsh Purul. Harsh says, uh, thank you for a very interesting conversation. Uh, it says, creativity, which is being discussed, uh, is an ability strength. How does Kriya make sure that the subject choices that the students make are appropriate to their ability strengths? Is there a criteria to making the correct choices and hence the career choice? Oh, uh, I see Akhila has left all the hard questions for me. Uh, so I, I tell you what we, um, <clears throat> uh, I mean, there's no uh, sort of, uh, 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 you know, sort of formula or so that we have at Korea in terms of this is the way we do things and that will enable students to, uh, to make exactly the right choice. Now, the couple of points actually, one is, uh, I don't even know what the right choice is and how much, what the right choice how much, you know, is the right choice of between what you do between 18 and 21 going to last you for the remaining 40 years? I find it a little difficult to believe that. It may be in certain cases, but as a generic statement, I find it very difficult to believe that. I think, generally speaking, you know, you should do what at that point of time you think you are most curious, excited, and passionate about. And if you make curiosity, passion, a habit, Maybe five years later, 10 years later, you'll do something else which you're curious and passionate about. And maybe another 10 years from now, from then, you will do again do something else which is driven by curiosity and passion. Right. So this is, just a, this is just a decision that you have to make at a certain point of time in life. And you can go ahead and do these decisions again and again, every five years, every 10 years, or every 15 years, if you wish. Now, what we do at Korea is that when you are getting admitted into Korea, you're not, you're getting admitted into Korea as a Korea student. 
not as a student who wants to study arts and literature or mathematics or computer science or any other subject. In the first year, uh, in fact, you're not even really introduced to the majors. You have the sort of first year 11 courses, which is a common core and skills curriculum for all students, irrespective of what they might want to major in or minor in or what they think they want to have a career in. So irrespective of your backgrounds or your interests, uh, you will have a course in literature and the arts. You'll have a course in writing and oral communication. You'll have a course in mathematical reasoning. You'll have a course in data science. You'll have a course in computer science. You'll have a course in philosophy, so on and so forth. And it's only at the end of one year that you really have to make up your mind in terms of what you'd like to major in. Now, just to deconstruct that, you know, I mean, if you do about somewhere between eight to 12 courses in a particular subject, that is deemed to be a major. So surely you can learn eight or 10, eight to 12 subjects any point of time in your life um, in another discipline, and that would be a major as well. So why restrict yourself? All it says is that at this point of time, you seem to be really curious or excited about history or math or philosophy or literature or arts. And that's what you'd like to spend the next 12, 14 uh, of your courses studying. That's it. I see no reason why that has to in any way decide what career you're going to take or what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Thank you, Gaurav. Anything else? No, but I'm having a sort of a delayed reaction to the previous question uh, where I said, you know, tough love and go and st be a self-starter, learn yourself. What I want to say is that change starts there. Change in our educational system will start with a different kind of learner de demanding a different kind of ethos in the classroom. And that's how we reform a system by all of us saying we don't want this. Uh, we want to do things differently. We want to think differently. We want to prepare ourselves for life differently. If you think of your education as a preparation for life, I mean, it's it's not it's a serious business, right? So we we need to stand up for what we believe in and work uh, work on things. Uh, as far as uh, this goes, uh, I think I already answered the question. I said that it doesn't matter what major you do. What you learn need to learn is to think critically and to solve problems. It doesn't matter what field you do it in. You have to be open to others so that you can work with them across fields. Thank you. So I think we'll end with the last question. We have last three minutes left. Uh, and this is an interesting question from Prabhjit. He says, every time I think of meta learning, the process of unlearning so as to relearn feels very important. How do both of you approach unlearning and relearning processes as academicians and practitioners in your lives? Oh, that's a... Uh... Um, I don't, I mean, I, I think that the whole thing of learning uh, to me sort of comes back to two things, which I see, which I, which I try and do as consistently as I possibly can. Uh, one is to constantly look for new experiences. And the other is engaging with people who are unlike minds. And I think I, you know, these two things, um, I'm not saying these are the only two, uh, but if I look back at my life or look at the choices I make sometimes knowingly, sometimes even unknowingly, right? a lot of the times it's just unknowingly. If there's a sort of new experience of some form, I, I just happen to show up there. And of course, from every new experience, you learn something, but I may, it's like, well, that was interesting, but I may not want to pursue it anymore. Um, but I think new experiences and interacting with unlike minds, uh, is is uh, you know a really great way of really learning, uh, learning in the larger scheme of things, or learning to learn, so to speak. Um, in the process, do I unlearn a few things? Uh, I think I do, but that's usually when you say, well, you know, these are the these are the ways I thought the world might work, and maybe those preconceived notions don't work anymore. Right? But I think to some extent, I unlearn when I learn. I can't. It's very hard for me to unlearn first and then learn. Because I don't know what to unlearn, because I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> so if I knew what I didn't know, then I would unlearn saying, OK, I need to delete this from memory, or delete this from habit, or delete this from, uh, from the way I behave. Uh, so I think I learn more, and then as a consequence of that, I unlearn. 
So that's the, the process that I usually follow and, and sort of you know, looking for new experiences and unlike minds uh, usually proves to be a, a sort of nice uh, a place to, to, to get the imagination going, for you to revisit, for pause and reflection, and, and to see whether, you know, to learn new things. Akhila? Well, I'll talk about the cases where you do know that you have to unlearn something since you've talked about the other. And I'll use, uh, Vikram mentioned I'm a fitness enthusiast, so it creeps into everything I say. So when you do know you have a problem, so I have weak uh, kneecaps. And uh, so my, they tend to swim around there. And my, whenever I do something like jog, my knees cave in like this. So when I do lunges, right? And if I don't spend a lot, of, that unlearning doesn't happen once. It's a lifetime's unlearning. You have to keep reminding yourself that your knee goes in. And you have to keep vigilant not to let it go in because it has some serious consequences for your health or well-being. And it's the same for mental stuff, right? So you have to keep remembering that this is an old habit. This is something that creeps back. It's kind of like cigarette smoking or anything else, right? The minute you let go, you're weak about it, it's going to come back. You're going to fall back into that pattern. And when we're scared, we fall back into old patterns. It always happens, right? So the thing is to constantly check in with yourself and to know that that unlearning has to happen on a daily basis it has to happen on a daily basis you have to say am i doing this the old way am i so holding up the mirror is the best way to un to think about unlearning when you know what the problem is thank you so much uh, for all of you for joining us i think we are now uh, have the time that we have uh, but thank you, Kila and Gaurav, for joining us. Um, we had more than 150 uh, you know, people who joined us for this webinar. There are a lot of questions that we didn't answer, but we'll make sure we send them all to uh, Kila and Gaurav and get you the answers. Thank you, and uh, we, we look forward to having you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much, for everybody, for coming, and thank you, Outreach, for organizing this so beautifully, and thank you, IT for doing your job splendidly as usual. Thank you all. It's been a real pleasure.